Nice to meet you all. I'm Andy Warfield, <laughs> CTO of, uh, of Coho Data and a co-founder. Um, so uh, we've talked about uh, the sort of premise of the company, building a sort of like demand um, acquisition storage system. We've talked about the pain of PCIe Flash and the fact that all future memories are going to exhibit the same pain and how it's hard to build a good data path for it. We've talked about how we use the SDN switch uh, to integrate with scaling that thing out. Um, and so now I'm going to talk about the sort of broader architecture of the system. Um, I, I kind of uh, was, it was getting late last night and the hotel bar was about to close, so I got a little <laughs> bit creative with titles, I guess. Um, uh, so, you know, th this is around data pragmatism and idealism. So now I've shown you the layout in the system, right? It is, it is effectively a bare metal object store, right? The system has these objects, right? The objects are basically sparse flash devices, right? It, it auto tiers in the node to move data out to disk. Um, depending on how we do with time, I'd be happy to go into some details on that because there's been lots of really interesting experience on that side of the system. Um, we built that bit of stuff and realized, um, based on uh, our own experiences with storage and, and technologies that we've been excited about ourselves in the past, that object storage doesn't really work in the enterprise yet. Right? Um, there have been a bunch of interesting systems. There are a bunch of interesting systems. Uh, generally, what happens is people get really excited about a bunch of mechanistic aspects of scaling things out and don't think practically about how they should be adopted. Right? And so one of the problems with object storage, like I said earlier, is that you either need a gateway node that's going to translate from some other protocol right, to your object protocol, right? and that thing becomes uh, a performance bottleneck, among other things. Um, or you need to change your clients. Right? You need to rewrite your clients to use some restful HTTP-based protocol, and now you have to, you know, the system will be wildly successful as long as I can change all the clients in the world. Right? Our sense, and... there yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> our, our, our sense is that we're going to get there, right? Lots of applications are being rewritten right now, and that there, there will be a bunch of innovations at the protocol level for storage. Um, we want to build a system that is forward-looking enough to enable and embrace those things. But we also want to sell some kit, right? And so what we did was we took a very conscious decision not to expose any of those object APIs in our GA product. I'm telling you about how they work. They're all there, but the GA product is around a specific enterprise use case, which is high-performance NFS, right? We built a V3 layer on top of the thing, right, as something that we could market and sell immediately that, that has relevance in the enterprise, right? So in taking the product, <coughs> there are additional layers that we will roll out as we go, right? And so this is the bit that I've explained to you so far, right? We, we actually describe that stack at the bottom as a sort of data hypervisor, right? It's responsible for multi-tenancy on the flash and for auto-tiering down to the disk. Um, and we wrap a bare metal object store across those, and those are the microarrays. Now, the rest of the system, this, the bit where we take advantage of the SDN switch, uh, borrows heavily from our experience um, with, with Zen and virtual machines. Um, what we've done is we've built a hosting layer for your storage controller and presentation. Right? So what you get is an environment where you can write storage protocol gateways. And instead of sticking them on an external box, they actually run co-located with these arrays, which means that they scale horizontally as you scale the system out. Right? So this thing that I described earlier around the NFS IP address, right, appearing to be a single IP address but scaling back across these boxes, right, we basically built a runtime where we implement NFS. The NFS TCP socket bindings right, seem to be talking to a single TCP stack but they're actually running across all of these nodes. Right? And so as you add nodes, the controller is transparently scaling out sideways right, to take advantage of the extra resources. So you're scaling the presentation, right, the, the, the storage presentation layer, along with the underlying data. And so this is intended to give you a sense of where we're going with stuff. Right? This, is, this is the V1. Right? This is our GA. It is, NFS v3 with the performance characteristics of like a PNFS, right, on top of this. And it's this and the integration between these things and the switch where we've done the bulk of our work. Right? 
as we move forward with the system, um, we will, in response to customer demand, add additional forms of presentation. Right? Um, these may be other storage protocols. Um, I thought when we started the company that we would get a lot of demand for iSCSI. Um, nobody has asked us for iSCSI. In fact, one of our pilot customers uh, said that they had, a month before we started the pilot, actually had a party in the office to celebrate the expulsion of the last LUN right, from, their, from their NAS environment. Um, uh, SMB, on the other hand, uh, we're seeing a lot of pull for. Um, and so that's one that we may, uh, we may take on. You know, SMB3 is just such a nice protocol. Yeah. Um, and it's a nice match for, uh, for what we're doing. So, uh, so that's one that we've started doing a little bit of looking at and, uh, and will likely be, uh, be prioritized as we go forward. Um, there are a couple of other things in here that are sort of interesting. One is this idea of IO bypass. And this is, right, this is basically taking the interface that NFS is using to talk to these things and presenting it out. So we built, uh, as a prototype, a version of MySQL where we take the MySQL block interface out the back, right? MySQL has a, a set of bindings for arbitrary storage, and we made MySQL talk to this, yeah. right? And so, yeah. so basically your idea is to write, write block devices, the device driver inside the hypervisor or a server that can talk directly. Or your applications or whatever. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, so all this is doing is it's just giving you a way to, to walk around the stack. Uh, take away all the layer. Exactly. And, and, go, right? straight, yeah. and go straight to the underlying storage. Right? So it's, it's if you have an environment where you're, and, and we've actually had asks for this from a bunch of the customers that we're talking to. This the, several of the, of the um, customers that, that we see, and I'll come back to this in the, in the last bit of the talk, have like pretty significant environments with their own application teams internally. And the, they're quite happy at the idea of something that hosts NFS for 80%, but lets them modify their app to use this for the other 20%. So. Um, <coughs> Another aspect of the thing, right, is this, this middle class of things, right, where I've got, on one hand, sort of more sophisticated key value stores um, and analytics of the Hadoop, Spark, et cetera, variety. Now, one thing in here that's interesting to think about is the position that I made for the system early in the talk, right, that you need this, like, balanced and well-provisioned alignment of flash, CPU, and network, right, is true to drive peak load, right? But if you, like most storage environments, have bursty load, Right, there are times when that idles. And so rather than going the full hyper-converged route and trying to figure out how you're going to manage peak load and contest with applications for resources, the more interesting question is, what should we do with the resources we have when we are not delivering peak load? And so this is where um, internally right, we're already doing some pretty interesting stuff. Right? So, um, we do things like take complete traces of, uh, of I.O. workloads during some periods, and we run analytics on the boxes when the system's idle to figure out how to do tiering. Right? So you know, we, we do a bunch of stuff on the box that takes advantage of Flash in a way that you wouldn't have had the, the, the media bandwidth to do on disk. <coughs> um, so th this is an area that, you know, that we're, we're exploring with a few customers and looking into delivering as a sort of additional so you presentation. So you, you put this... Analytics code out in the GA product so that customers uh, are running, you, you're doing IO tracing and analyzing their IO trace to in order to understand how to do better tiering? Yeah. yeah. On the boxes that are in the customer side? Yeah. So the box adapts to the customer workload, right? Right. On and how's that, how's that information get back to you guys? Though, they're just doing it for that customer's workload. I understand. Well, oh, yeah. The question is how do you get that information back to the back to your site so you can change the algorithm to, to no, 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 it's, 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 it's happening <coughs> in the box, right? The algorithm is, is tuning itself based on customer workload. So an example of this is um, I can do uh, statistical analysis on storage workloads and go every morning at 2 o'clock you do a bunch of database indexing, right? So I expect this data to have a forward so distance in the cache. You're not changing the code for the caching algorithm. You're changing some of the parameters and what you're caching when and stuff like that. Yes, yes. So if I if I re-index my database at two a.m., does that mean that you prefetch? The, the, exactly. There's two things that are interesting, right? Every two a.m. One is well, every one a.m. so that it's ready for two a.m. If I can build support for the fact that this access is going to be made exactly every twenty-four hours, right? I can get the data in ahead of it happening. And the second one is I can get the data out and the old stuff back in after it's happened, so that when your VDI users come in at nine a.m., right, they don't thrash bringing in the data that the database indexing threw out at two a.m. Okay. What's your? Can we extend that out 
to 95 days so that my end of quarter process gets yeah, what's your what's your what's your level of we're, granularity or we're, we're doing a bunch of stuff on this um, the the GA is relatively primitive in terms of what it does but we we employ a statistician so, so uh, yes yeah, yeah, let me try so, to understand now, you're running Hadoop <laughs> in the in the, the storage no, for for this stuff, we're doing our own stuff. Right? We've, oh, we've built we built our own uh, trace analytics. analytics. Yeah, so yeah the, the, on it. the sets of data aren't that Hadoop big. isn't the right thing for this time series style no, I understand. analysis. Yeah. Um, that interesting. Yeah, especially for you know organizations that you know base you know eighty percent of their load is is day shift. Yes. Now you've got. All that time to do the analysis overnight to figure out exactly, if you could do really, exactly, exactly. You know, look, the end of month, which you know we spent a hundred thousand dollars to make the storage system fast enough to do end of month, or we pinned that file. Well, those so files let me actually. Flash. I'm going to come back to this point in our in our UI because I've got a, a fun sort of example to show you there. How am I doing for <coughs> time? Um, okay, the. The only thing that this chart, this plot is the plot that I showed you toward the beginning of the talk around uh, ESX NFS load, right, creeping up. And the thing to see from this chart is that there's like this one third performance okay. improvement when you run okay. no. Linux NFS, right, instead of going through ESX, right? ESX in the test that we did here wasn't presenting sufficient, this isn't, uh, I want to be clear, this isn't an ESX overhead so much as it's an ESX pipelining problem. Right, they're not exposing enough um, uh, requests in the queue to saturate the flash. Right? Right. And there's no tunable to say, show me more requests. Um, and so this was something that we saw over the summer. If you go to the bypass thing, you get another chunk above this. Right? As you peel away the layers is what this is sort of hinting at. Right? You get better performance. OK, so now um, where are we? We're 920. I think we're, we're doing pretty good for time. So, I want to um, show you the UI relatively quickly, um, and then I want to show you a preview feature that's not in the GA product, um, but it relates to some of this IO trace analysis um, and get your feedback on it. Um, and then I think we'll basically be done. I'll talk about a couple of customers quickly, um, and then we'll be finished. Um, so once again, um, I'm Andy Warfield. Um, Hi, Andy. What's that? <laughs> How you doing? Um, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm the CTO and a co-founder of Coho Data, and now I'm going to tell you about our UI. Um, and so, I think this just says UI demo. Um, so let me just give you like a Wiley Coyote sign. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and the edge of a cliff. <laughs> well, it's the PO to Acme. Yeah. All right. So this is our this is our UI. It's actually our second uh, our second UI. Um, so we built this, uh, we went out into our first round of pilots. Um, they said the UI looked pretty nice, but couldn't you do all this stuff? And so we threw it out and we rebuilt the UI. Right? We, we have a UX team um, in the office in Vancouver, uh, two guys out of a HCI and UX background. We work with an external designer. Uh, one of the things that we set out to do with the UI was not make it look like a home NAT gateway from 1992, which is how most storage UIs that I've worked with look. Um, the other thing that we really set out to do is to decouple it from hardware, right? Like we really want this to be something that you expect to stare at over more than the life of an individual. But probably the most important question is, what is this? Is this Flash, HTML5, <laughs> <laughs> oh, or, or Java? It's, uh, what is this running? It's, it's, it's all HTML5. Okay. Um, <laughs> You're okay. You can move on. All now. right. <laughs> Hardest question I got during Tech Field Day. Yeah. Um, okay. The. Uh, the, I mean, I, I'm not going to waste a lot of time going through this. I just want to give you a sense of what's here, right? So um, uh, we break off the left of the display into human action required things. And, you know, you guys, you guys should relate to this. It's tweets, right? The, you know, this is uh, tweets from your array, basically. Maybe that's a 1.1 feature. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because you know, the, 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 there's nothing I want more than 500 tweets <laughs> in my array. <laughs> Shows a picture. It's out drinking right. at night. <laughs> Well, with the googly eyes and the yeah, smile, you, you know. Exactly. <laughs> you should have seen the Nexus. Um, anyway, the uh, the you know these are things that a human has to do. These are things that the array has done, right? So you know responses. You get a quick overview of of the health of the system and big changes on here. Um, if I uh, Thursday. is this Thursday? Is Nobody likes Thursday. 
That's oh, today. this is Thursday. Wait, it's <laughs> gone morning. morning. Yep, sorry. Morning. I just, I just triggered a, hard a uh, hard drive failure in here. Right, and so we can go into danger, the... Danger, uh, Will Robinson, danger. Right, you get to, you can draw your rack if you want to, be a little bit creative. Um, right, you can go in here and lay it out. You can lay out other servers and stuff. Um, I can click on this box and it shows me the thing that's blinking. Um, right, I can flash the light on the back of it and go and replace the disk. Right, when I heal the system, the thing comes back and it goes off to the activity stream. Um, uh, this is slightly dated in that the GA shows all the right serial numbers and everything in terms of live status of everything. You get the, the switch status and all the links. Uh, we've done a bunch of work in here to help diagnose wiring problems. Um, so if you, if you wire incorrectly, right, it will, it will tell you. Um, in terms of the product GA, right, there's integrated snapshot support with snapshot scheduling. You get a default schedule. Right? And, it's, can, and they're per VM snapshots. Per right? VM snapshots in here. Um, uh, we are in the process of generalizing to general purpose NFS uh, workloads, which we'll, we'll put out next year. Mm -hmm. um, all, of our, all of our pilots are VMware sites right now. Right. Um, so we've like, focused on VMware for the initial release. Um, in the NFS case, you'll be able to set that at a, at a subtree granularity. Um, okay, sure. is, there, is there some volume-like concept? I mean, no. you're, you're, okay. So I can't segregate into containers that way. Um, we will, we're, we're going through a bunch of UX stuff with this right now. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I understand in the data storage, you, that would be a really bad idea yes, with your but you absolutely want an abstraction here for that kind of thing. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is one that, uh, that we're working through. Okay. Um, uh, if you're interested in giving us feedback on that, I would be we, we can talk. happy to show you some of that as we get yeah. initial versions of it. I, I mean, it could just, it could be as simple as, you know, tree branches. Yep. That's that's the idea that we're working with right now. Is it's just you know, this out. branch is, is acts like it was a volume, and and you can you still snapshot at that level. Yep. And you'd still use all the nodes for the performance and everything. That's right. Yeah. That's right. It's it's more like just an abstraction for yeah. 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 It's it's just to deal with the people who have to have so that. Yeah. Is the metadata for the NFS directory distributed across the nodes, or is it? Yes. And that's actually the bulk of the work that we're doing um, for the general purpose NFS uh, between now and next year is um, we focused for the first release really, really significantly on the uh, NFS data path, right? So it's low latency and, uh, and high bandwidth and right. does all the right thing with the connections. As, as you'll start allowing more generalized applications, locking and things like that start getting uglier exactly. and uglier. Yep. And, and POSIX ACLs. And yes, right. So that stuff is working at the layer above this. Um, a file. Say something like that. No, but a, but a file a file system for VMware yeah. gets to leave out a whole lot of stuff that a file system for anything else needs to do. Yes. You know, which is which is why VMFS works at all because they didn't need to implement That's true. a full file system. Um, so the, there are two last things that I want to show you. Here. Um, what we've tried to do with scale is to provide the storage admin the evidence that they need to justify the investment in the system. Right, in terms of their own budgeting processes, in terms of understanding when to scale, in terms of understanding when flash is a good idea. So we've cooked in a relatively simple showback interface into the system that lets you tag VMs according to business units. Right? We, uh, we tier out the storage in terms of uh, pin, to, pin to flash, right? do the best you can with flash, or try not to use flash right? in terms of enterprise per critical and non-production. Um, and in response to those tags, um, right, you can grow out and see R&D's consumption billing of storage right, per unit time. Uh, an earlier version of this actually generated invoices and mailed them to people. Nobody wanted that. Uh, <laughs> one person wanted that. One person asked if, uh, one CIO asked if we could integrate with Salesforce and just not send IT the bill at all. Just bill the business units for the storage. We'll administer the box. But, uh, I don't think we're there yet. Oh, ballsy. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK. So the other one I want to show you is, uh, is this. And so, you know, we do the, the stuff that you would expect in terms of collecting logs and letting you see latency IOPS throughput, you know, capacity over time. Is there a decimal um, point in there or is that 40, micro, 40 milliseconds? Um, where are you? Latency. It's NFS, man. Oh, these are, <laughs> are 2.1. It's actually 40 seconds, Howard. It's NFS. Oh, no, there's a decimal point. Um, that makes sense. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you've got six? <laughs> I think the first person to bring it up was Stephen Foskett. <laughs> yes. The never say SIFS guy said SIFS. So um, 
we wanted to, the difference in performance between flash and the disks underneath them, between these PCIe flash devices is, like I've said, I can't say it enough times, like really problematic, right? But that difference, right, is also a big deal. Once you start falling over onto the disk, you really notice it from a performance perspective. And your effective use of flash is entirely workload dependent. Right? There are some workloads that with a single box right, will do fine, and there are some workloads that just simply cannot do fine right, in Flash. Um, we wanted to work on a, a bit of stuff in the UI to make it really, really easy to diagnose those problems, right? to understand performance issues in the, in the system. And so I'm going to show you the, the very primitive first version of it, and then I'm going to preview you the newer version right, that we're working on for post-GA. One so, second latency? Yes. Right. So That's... Things have gone terribly wrong, right? Yeah. That point, <laughs> yeah. Right. And so, um, uh, exceeding 15 milliseconds means that you're like well off the saturation bandwidth of flash, right? And exceeding right. one second means that you're over the saturation bandwidth of disk, right? You're stacking up requests right. on the disk, right? right? Yeah. It's uh, it's not uncommon to see this in you know traditional storage environments under heavy load, right? Diabolical load. And so, what this is showing you is right. For the last week, the system's been mostly healthy, right? There were a couple of blips where I saw longer latencies, and then there was this one really bad period. And you hover over this, it'll give you a list of the VMs that were involved in that period of time, right? So sales. this is just a... It's always the sales, it's the sales department. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's always sales. This is just a, you know, what's, what's been happening in the system, right? Over the week, how healthy is it, right? We want, you know, just a fast view on that. Um, the way that this is going to shape up is pretty neat. Um, so you use the flash as a cache rather than a, a separate tier? I mean, you actually always have the data on the back end disk? Um, no, it's, it's a tier. I mean, the, it's, it's not, the back end is not consistent uh, with regard to the, to the flash. You, there are times when the data is in the flash. Right? Only. Yeah. 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 Um, so it is you have a You have a DRAM cache as well? No. I mean, no. There's no DRAM cache? No, we're just, the PCI is flash and fast enough that we're, we're just using the PCI. We may look, depending again on commodity, at some of the new DRAM technologies like the, the NV, Viking NVRAM DIMMs. NV, NV yeah. and, um, it's, and it's just a cost decision for us, right? The software stack will trivially tier onto that. And the replication is done by uh, one of the data storage nodes. So, I mean, the data lands on one node, and then it would, if necessary, it would be replicated from that node to another node? Um, we. Or is it replicated through the SDN? It's replicated through the dispatch on the receiving node right now, right? So it comes in. So through the you, dispatch on which? On the node that is serving the NFS head right now. Okay. Um, there's, some, there's some exciting stuff in the works there, and I can tell you about it later if, uh, if you want. Um, but right now, that's how that works. Um, so this is that so same. The data, when it comes into the system, lands on uh, the NFS head on its flash, and then it's replicated. Yes. Somewhere. OK. Yeah. And, and multiple. Microarrays act as the NFS. No, a single, yes. a well, single microarray acts. One microarray acts as the NFS head for that connection, right? But your connections right. are spread, but connection spread across, across yes. all of them. Yeah. Spread across all of them, and that's connection based, not 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 data access being access based. That's right, and that's the thing I can tell you some some more exciting stuff about okay. later. That's a TCP limitation. Right now. You can't get the data access space because they're in the middle of the packets, right? The NFS right. header is in the middle of yeah, your yeah. TCP payload. <coughs> um, talk to the NSA about that. They'll tell you how to make yes, it. Yes, yes. NSA <laughs> store. <Yeah. laughs> I call you. They already know. Um, so this and is. And when you talk to them, could you have them restore my email? <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, this is this preview that I that I mentioned, right? So this is the next version of that thing, um, and this is using the analytic stuff that we're we're tracking on the system. So. Um, what you see here is a week's access, right? And, and we're working on ways to make this clearer, but you see two periodic patterns, right? You see these orange areas in the middle of the night. This is the 2 a.m. database index rebuild, right? We're using sort of faked out data for this to sort of show it. Um, but you have this diabolical database indexing thing happening at 2 a.m. every day. And then you got a VDI storm happening first thing in the morning and right after lunch every day, okay? And so to dig into what's going on here, you simply highlight the regions. Right? And you get the list of workloads right, and what's happening in there. You can drag this across and hold the lens over the appropriate region. You can see what your VMs are doing in terms of, in terms of generating load. Right? Ooh, it lets you realize yeah, right, that you're seeing. Old is high everywhere. 
These are, well, again, these are faked out numbers, right? So we're, there's a script that generates this stuff, right? <laughs> but what this is trying to simulate is a bunch of database indexing jobs that are doing random access to an enormous working set, right? They're just hammering the disks. There's right. no way to keep it in class. And therefore, you get a 60% yes. cache hit rate because you're, you're running through all the data. Exactly. You're falling off the end of the world. Um, whereas in the, in the VDI case... That's why we do it at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Right? In the VDI case, it's just too many VDI clients at once. And so one of the things that we're doing with this analytics that's pretty fun is when you fall into these regimes of, of painful performance, we turn on tracing. Right? So we preserve a complete IOPS trace for ah. our region. Right? So th this is actually really cheap to do on Flash. Right? It takes about four bytes per IO. Right? You can compress them down to about two bytes. You write them to a log. Right? Huge numbers of I.O. events fit into a page of Flash, and you just trickle them down in the background. It's not an appreciable overhead right? in terms of the load you're taking. When the system goes idle, we do a bunch of modeling on the thing. And what we do is we simulate what the cache hit rate would have been had you bought more hardware a week ago. Right? And so what the UI lets you do is show that plot with one and two additional That's nodes awesome. a week ago. That's awesome. Right? <laughs> and so what it's doing is it's taking the contents of the cache and the workload and it's playing it forward, right? And, and taking, it's, it's not perfect, but it's taking a, you know, a reasonable approximation at what the system would have. And oh. the thing that I want you to realize here is it doesn't get better for this one, right? And that's the thing that we want the customer to see. No, right? But we that's at 3 o'clock in the morning and I don't care. You, you got rid of all of the nasty yellow bars in the middle of the day that right. make the phone ring. <laughs> right, so it's, it's really around... Oh, yeah, we all need this slide. Showing, uh, <laughs> showing how the system uh, scales up. But let me say very clearly, we need this. That is just too cool. Screenshot now. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean... How much, uh, how much if, flash? If I a, was still a VAR, there, this is like... Here, just cards give me and some and cash. The, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's 3.2 terabytes. The, the the current, two, two <laughs> They're 800 gig cards. Oh, yeah. Where to, where's the buy now button? <laughs> Amazon one in, yeah. click. <laughs> the one click. Buy now button. Prime shipping. <laughs> Amazon will even deliver it on Sunday. <laughs> that was actually uh, the the same the same meeting where uh, where the guy was saying, "Can you use Salesforce to bill my VUs?" Um, someone asked for us to have an option that would drop ship you at eighty percent capacity, right? Additional gear, right? They, right. They'll just show up. A plus n version of this as well. Um, how many nodes do I need to, to remove all bars? Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, calculate me how many nodes I need. 27. Be conservative, though. <laughs> yeah, you know, like double the number. Right, right. Gotta pad it there. Uh, yeah. With the button order now. <laughs> yeah. As soon as they put it in. Wow, even Duncan likes it. <laughs>